Notice the journeys. Notice the struggles. Notice the success. Notice that we are much more than just athletes. You've heard the stories, but not quite like this. New episodes weekly on Thursday. It's time for the world to take notice. Episode seven of Take Notice. I'm your host, Dwayne Notice. Um, I got somebody that inspirational to me, someone that I grew up looking up to, still look up to, someone that has helped mold me into a better man, better basketball player, uh, gave me my first initial nickname growing up, grade eight. Um, that's what I was known to everybody because of him. I got somebody that um, represents our country the best he can every time he puts on the jersey and is a force in the basketball community in our hometown. So um, Kevin Pangos, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, you know, I know a little bit more about your history just because I, you know, like I said, I've known you for a long time, but this is the warm up. So just let everybody know how your upbringing was. I know you have a great family dynamic. I love my family as well. I know you have an older sister and you have great parents that um, kind of push you and love you and support you. Are those the people that influenced you to play basketball or what was a defining moment in your life that allowed you to want to play the sport at the highest level? Yeah, for sure. So I'm uh, I'm from Holland, Canada. Uh, my dad is a, or was a college coach at York University um, for 20 something years, a long time. Um, my mom played basketball at Mac University and uh, my older sister played for five years for my dad at York. Um, so basketball is kind of in the family. Um, and for myself, I kind of grew up playing all sports. So I played, I played basketball, I played soccer, I played hockey, I played volleyball. Um, I tried to be as well-rounded as I could. Um, and then basketball was kind of the sport that just stuck. You know, I could play it every day nonstop, and I never got tired of it. Um, obviously, you know, my parents were influenced with that. You know, they, they brought me around the game and kind of introduced me and stuff, but um, they'd actually have to try and pull me away. I remember my mom would always try to, to you know, take me away from basketball because she didn't want me to get burnt out. And so she, she would constantly try to have me do other things. She tried to have me play piano. I never uh, stuck. She tried to have me do art. And I never stuck, you know, but I tried. I just couldn't, didn't enjoy it, you know. So um, the basketball is a thing I could do nonstop. And uh, luckily, because, you know, now it's, it's my job. And so um, I'm fortunate enough to play for a living. That's funny because growing up, my mom always tells me that when I was a kid as well, she like tried to get me to play soccer, organize football, uh, got me in swimming, got me in a whole bunch of stuff, volleyball, but I wasn't having it. I was like basketball, basketball, basketball. But it's cool to see as a kid, as you grow up, like even when you're on the playground playing different sports, how it kind of affects your skill set and allows you to be better at the sport of basketball. For sure. I think, I think so too. Like, like even now, I wish I could play, had more time for other sports because the, the translation is huge, you know, whether exactly. it's soccer or running and cutting or football or whatever it is, like, that type of stuff benefits you without you even knowing. And so right. I wish I had more time to play those things now, but you just, you know, you get in the schedule and that's how it is. Exactly. Now you mentioned that, you know, your father, Bill, was uh, a coach. Um, you know, I talked to Tyler Ennis about this a lot, but having a father who, you know, played or coached the game and then has to be your father and also coach you as well. How do you manage that father-son dynamic when your father's a coach and you're a basketball player? Like, is it, the cliche, you know, he's mad at you for something you did on the court and you're at home and you're upset and you guys don't talk until you got dinner. Or like, how does it go? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I think it's different for everyone. Um, for my dad and I, I'd say um, growing up, he actually did a really good job of kind of stepping back and kind of letting me do my thing. Um, I don't know if he it was easy for him. It seemed easy, but I don't know if it was really easy. I think he always wanted to, like, coach me and tell me this and that. Um but then as we get older now, it, it's, I'm at the point now where it's difficult because I love talking basketball with my dad, but, you know, it's probably not good, but I feel like I, I know it all. You know, I, I challenge him all the time, yeah. you know, like, like, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm right. I have this, you know, I've done it this way. And so we have these discussions all the time and I have to also look back and say like, you know, my dad taught me basically everything I know about basketball. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I've had different perspectives and different people coach me up on this and that, but like, the root of the game for me was everything my dad taught me. So I wouldn't be here today without, you know, his influence and guidance. So um, I always had to step back and like put my pride aside sometimes and just say like, you know, my dad did a lot for me. Don't challenge him to try to, you know, one up him all the time. Yeah. Um, but it's great having a dad that, you know, played the game and knows the game really well. Cause we talk about hoops all the time, you know, whether it's my games, 
pro games, whatever, college games, this and that. We're always tuned in to basketball and it's fun. Man, that's awesome. I know you mean though, because I it's hard watching basketball with my family because I'm always trying to uh, you know, nah, that's a DHO, nah, this is that. You should have did this instead of that. And it's like I gotta just take a step back and remember that, you know, they haven't played at the highest level. And it doesn't mean that I can't discredit them for being fans or what they know of the knowledge of the game. Uh, I remember us going to Italy um when I was when I was a little kid. And yeah. you know, that's around the time you gave me the nickname uh grade eight. And I remember uh, it was me, you, I remember uh, Anthony Bennett, Robo, and you were doing, Nick Lewis and guys like that, you were doing things like stretching while we were in the, the host family uh, uh, house. You had the, the, the white rope, you were stretching, you were making sure you were eating right, um, nutrition wise, you were, I think you were even had the protein shake back then, probably um, just doing things like that at such a young age. What allowed you or what gave you the, the I guess, the guidance to be so professional at a young age because we were not doing that. All of us were not doing that. We weren't stretching before and after games. We weren't taking care of our body like that. The same way that guys are doing now in their professional careers, um, you know, stretching and, you know, doing the protein intake and anything like that, you were doing it at a young age. So what was the mentality for you that made you start so young? Yeah, I was a pretty weird kid, I think. Um, I think I did it at a really young age and everyone kind of looked at me like, what's this guy doing? You know, it's yeah. over the top of the area. And so, I had to kind of keep on doing it and, and not let what people said or thought um, affect me. Because for me, I, I wanted to do everything I could to put myself in the best situation, you know, to, to become a pro and be the best player I could. And so I don't know what the exact moment was where I learned these things. I think it was over time, a bunch of different people influenced me into teaching me about nutrition, teach me about stretching. I don't know exactly if there's one there's so many people i've met along the way from guys at the national team like sam gibbs or um different players i played with and, and met one that kind of sticks out is when i was i think 15 mm -hmm. i went to the national team training camp um i got fortunate enough to be invited maybe i was a little older 16 or something um, with the senior men's team and first off i was so nervous i'm a little <laughs> little kid you know and i'm like yeah. going with these grown men like i'm exactly. so nervous and so I, again, I had to battle through that mental barrier and be like, no, 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 go, this is a good opportunity. And so I went there um, and it wasn't easy. I was uncomfortable for the majority of the camp. Um, and then at the end, I actually got invited to go to a trip with Italy, to Italy with them again, so nervous. And I was like, no, no, you got to do this. It's a great opportunity once in a lifetime. Um, but throughout that, I don't know, week, two weeks, three weeks of training camp and then going to Italy with that team, I got to witness all these like grown men that were already professionals, mm -hmm. um, you know, perfecting their craft and that whether that's getting there early to get shots up, recovering afterwards, um, studying the game in themselves. I remember I had a roommate, um, his name was Tyler Kepke, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, and he was watching this documentary on like some mental, you know, well being thing. And I was like, what is this? Like, this is so boring, you know? Yeah. But it gave me the experience of like, hey, listen, these guys are trying to find anything they can to make themselves better. Um, yeah. Whether that's like the smallest percentage, you mm -hmm. know, that mental stuff, the stretching, the nutrition. And so when I saw that, it kind of just opened a whole different realm of like, wow, there's so much more than just like ball handling drills, you know? Yeah. There's so much more than just like shooting drills. Um, to make yourself better because we're humans you know we step on the court and it translates so i think that was kind of the one that sticks out but again i had a lot of experiences i think growing up where they kind of introduced me to to that stuff and i i tried to do it at a young age and try to keep going wow that's interesting you said that because uh i had a coach um who's one of my trainers the past few years uh ryan smith who Basically, he always said that, like, as professional athletes, a lot of us are skilled. A lot of us are, you know, good at the sport. That's our professional basketball player. So it's like there's a lot of other things that encompass being a basketball player. And if you could do the little things, whether it's going to sleep a little earlier than the next guy, whether it's eating a little better than the next guy, like you said, watching videos, like anything that you could do to gain a little small advantage will always pay off in the long run. So you mentioned the national team and you always had this comparison of Steve Nash. So. Yeah. How do you feel about being compared to like one of the greatest basketball players to ever, you know, come out this country? And two, what is your relationship like with him? I know that you guys, um, you know, he's kind of like a, a great, a great kind of mentor to you. And it probably, you know, means a lot to you in your career. Yeah. Um, 
Good question. Because it, it, it's a lot of different things that have gone through my mind with that through the years. Now, at first, I think I, I tried to avoid it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I really tried to like ignore that stuff and no, 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 like Steve Nash, ignore, ignore, ignore. Um, but at the same time, it was such an honor, you know, the yeah. guy's the MVP, one of the best point guards of all time. And so I, I can't just completely ignore it. But I think what I wanted to do was I really wanted to become my own person, you know, mm-hmm. and there was a phase where I think I was trying to be too much like Nash, you know, and do exactly what he did. But, but everyone's different, you know, yeah. everyone's unique. And so I think as I got older, I, I stopped caring so much about the comparisons and tried to to use the good of it. Like, hey, that, yeah, he's a great player, great person. So why wouldn't I guide myself in that direction to try and become a form of that, mm-hmm. but be Kevin Pangos at the same time, you know? And so um, now I still try to, you know, learn from every single point guard out there and not try to be so much like him, but not try to ignore it completely. And yeah. I have a mix, you know? So um, now I learn from all different point guards, watch everyone, try to pick up whatever piece of their game I can to add it to mine. Um, and now I've kind of developed my own style, I like to think. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, on top of that, the other thing, though, too, is I think it was great because it was an easy comparison to make, but it also made sense because if I watch him play, uh-huh. um, he's the same height as me. You know, he's got the same physical attributes as me, similar. Um, and so what he's doing on the court, the way he kind of plays in the style, I feel like that made sense for me because if I wanted to get to that level, Mm-hmm. I knew I had to be some form of that as well. So I tried to use that to my advantage too. I wasn't going to be going and dunking on guys. Like <laughs> I was kind of realistic, you know? Yeah. So I did try to take that as well as a positive and be like, okay, it makes sense. You know, he's doing this against all different levels of players. Mm-hmm. So if I kind of do something somewhat in that realm, then it, it, I could probably get to the close to that level as well. So I kind of use that as well. And then now going forward, uh, the second part of the question is, um, you know, I've worked with him a little bit, you know, I went to LA one time that he was, uh, nice enough to work out with me, um, mm-hmm. took some of his time, you know, it, he benefited nothing from it, but it was an amazing experience for me. I went down there for a couple of days and worked out with him. Mm-hmm. Um, tried to pick his brain. Um, and when he's come out to, to Spain, when I was there for, for some of the soccer matches, we, uh, you know, went out to brunch and, and, you know, caught up and stuff and he's been great, you know, great mentor for me to just kind of picked the brain of great friend, you know, he always, you know, touches in with me and say, Hey, Kev, how's it going? And um, it's a great guy that I can just reflect ideas off of. And, and he's one of a kind, you know, a guy in, in that situation, um, you know, like Steve has so many things to do and takes the time to, to yeah. shoot you a message and, and just say, Hey, how's it going? You know, he doesn't benefit anything from it other than just another friend. And it's unbelievable. It, it still shocks me to this day that, that uh, he takes that much time and is so sincere about it. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, uh, like you said, you're from Holland Landing, and I want to know what your recruitment process was because how did you, especially when we were in high school, it was very difficult to get exposure unless you were Andrew Wiggins or <laughs> someone like that. Um, yeah. Other than that, a lot of our, a lot of guys our age in our age group were heading to the states and going doing the prep school route. What made you want to decide to you know just stay um, in Newmarket and then you know be a force there and then still get recruited to Gonzaga? Yeah, so um, when I look back, I actually did consider going to prep school for a moment. Oh, it, wow. definitely, it definitely was. I don't know if we've even talked about this before, but I did, I did consider it. Um, you know, myself and my parents, obviously, we discussed everything together because at the time I'm young. I don't know exactly yep. what's best for me. I think I, I think I do, but they guided me as well. Um, and so for my senior year, I it was stay at Denison or possibly go prep. And the prep schools were just – it was the unknown, you know, yep. there were some good situations, but there were some not so good ones and you kind of got lost in the shuffle there, you know? And so that was kind of scary about that. Um, and so we didn't get into the point where I was really close to going, mm-hmm. where it was like a couple of days away um, because we found a kind of plan for me back home. And so I found a trainer at St. Mike's actually, Matt Nickel, um, yep. that I worked with and, I worked with Sam Gibbs as well. And we kind of had a, a training program. I was getting facilities that I could get into the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had good competition of guys back home in high school still where there was still going to be some competitive stuff. And I think at that time there was also, um, was it PEP or something? Yeah, it was PEP, yeah. Program at yeah. UFT that we would do, right? Yep. So 
the combination made it so I still had um, a plan where I could get better, you know, and I had the resources, had the competition, had the training, um, everything that I needed um, that I felt to, to make myself better and be ready for when I went to, to school at D1. So um, if that wasn't the case, I probably would have gone prep if there was a better alternative, but I just felt like uh, I had everything I needed back home. And then as for the re recruiting, I really didn't get um, recruited by a ton of schools. I got recruited by some quality ones, but yeah. I wasn't overloaded with like 50 offers. You know, I wasn't yeah. that type of guy. So um, a lot of my looks came from national team, actually. Um, I know when we went to Hamburg, Germany, I remember there were coaches, you know, yeah. course, I remember, like Bruce Pearl was there. I think Coach Cal, there were a bunch of coaches and stuff. Um, and so some of the coaches got to, to see me play for national team uh, mm -hmm. since I didn't play much AU. And then the other one was just kind of word of mouth. You know, I'd play with, um, with some guys or with some coaches with national team. And I know um, one of them was Greg Francis, who coached uh, Kelly Olenek, national team, myself as well. And so since Kelly was at Gonzaga, I guess Greg told the coach, he's like, hey, come take a look at this, this one kid, Pangos. Um, he might be a good fit. And sure enough, the Gonzaga coaches came down and, um, you know, started recruiting me from there. Um, and then it came down to Gonzaga and Michigan were kind of the, the top two. I had a couple others like Notre Dame and Virginia in there. Um, but Gonzaga just stuck out. It was the, the one that I felt like I could fit the best and see myself going to. And uh, I'm glad I did. All right. Awesome. Okay. It's halftime. I uh, noticed my steez. I'm just going to ask you five questions, six questions about like your favorite, whatever. So favorite pregame meal. Pre-game meal, probably just simple pasta, pasta chicken. Okay. Favorite hobby? Favorite hobby? <laughs> Some <laughs> sort of sports. Some sort of sports. Um, if that's the boring answer, I'll go with guitar. I like to play a little guitar on the oh, side. Oh, really? Are you nice yeah. or? <laughs> you no, no, not really. I'm a work, work in progress. Work okay. in progress. <laughs> uh, favorite city you've traveled to? Uh, favorite city, Barcelona. I got a chance to live there today. But yeah, Barcelona for sure. I gotta check it out. I've been there. we we went to Spain, but I don't think it was Barcelona. Yeah, I don't know where we went. I don't remember, but yeah, we went there for. I think it was a smaller town. Yeah. Um, favorite artist of all time. Favorite artist of all time. Or now, Khalid. now and of all time. Now, I'd say now, Khalid. I like Khalid okay. a lot. Okay, he's nice. Yeah. Okay, and last one. Favorite memory at Gonzaga. Favorite men memory, uh, making the Elite Eight for sure. Special. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't make a final four like you. Hey, I always man. wanted to. Uh, I always wanted to, but I never got there. I don't even want to talk about it because you're school. <laughs> I was so sad, man. Oh man. And that was one of those games where, because they had Nigel Williams goals, and at the time he wasn't like you know the best three point shooter. And the scouting report said go under. Like he was an under under. Like if they rescreen, we would go under again. And that game he hit like seven threes, and it was one of those games where you. Where we look at the coach, yeah. like, are you gonna yeah. stick to the game plan? <laughs> are you gonna make an adjustment? But <laughs> that atmosphere was crazy. Yeah, the final four was insane. But speaking about that, um, you mentioned Kelly Olynyk, um, one of my big bros as well, playing in the Team Canada, um, national team program. Um, how was it watching him? Well, first of all, playing with him at Gonzaga, and then how was it watching him on the NBA final stage? Like I know for me, just seeing so much pride. Um, I had a teammate from South Carolina, Chris Silva, who's also on the Miami Heat. So just watching them on that stage is like incredible. And to play against LeBron, one of the um, best players in the game, um, is, is pretty cool to, as well. So just seeing Kelly O'Lennon be your teammate and go from there to playing in the NBA Finals, what did that what did that mean to you? Yeah, no, it was amazing seeing Kelly at that level. Um, playing with him for our time at Gonzaga was special you know his red shirt year actually so my freshman year was his uh red shirt year that he took mm -hmm. um seeing the guy i was fortunate enough to see the work he put in you know everyone sees like oh he red shirted but it's not just that he red shirt it's that he made the most of that red shirt yeah. year. you know the guy we'd have to try and split uh we use the same rebounder so we'd have to try and like <laughs> organize our times at night when we were shooting because he'd be in there and and he's like a he'd stay up super late. So he'd be in there for hours late at night, you know? So yeah. I had to make sure that I got in there before he did or else like I wouldn't be getting <laughs> shots up, you know? So yeah. I'd always go first and he'd go second. Uh, that was kind of our arrangement, but I got to see the work he put in, you know, every single night, extra time in the weight room, 
Um, he was eating super healthy during that redshirt year. Like he did, it's not a fluke that he developed as much as he did. Um, and then I got to play with him the next year and it was amazing, you know, playing pick and roll, pick and pop with him was, was special because he's one of a kind, you know, skill wise um, mm. for that size. And then going to this year NBA finals, you know, it wasn't a shock that he was performing the way he was. Obviously he had a bigger opportunity because some guys went down. Um, but again, opportunity doesn't mean results. But with exactly. Kells, he, he took advantage of that, you know. Um, when his, his name was called, he was ready. And it didn't shock me at all that he performed really well. Um, great to see him on that stage because uh, all the work he put, it, put in for, for everything, he deserves it. And so, uh, no, it was amazing. Great to see him do so well. Wow. All right. So my next question from one great shooter to a uh, good shooter, me. Uh, <laughs> so it's I, I read somewhere at Gonzaga that you're like the leader three pointers made, which is I think is dope with like 313 threes, and you're like fifth all time in the WCC. And uh, I think in 2015 you won the three point uh, contest uh, championship for college basketball. You did, you did your research. I did a little research. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, as a, as a shooter, like me growing up, I was always a slasher, you know, athletic guy. And then it wasn't until university where I became a better shooter with repetition and just, um, you know, watching game film and watching film myself working out. Um, as a great shooter like yourself, what what is it? Is it more mental preparation? Is it more reps? Or what? how, how did you become such a great shooter? Yeah, it's interesting you said that you started as a slasher and then had to develop the other way around because – uh, mine actually, like I said, everyone's different. Mine was actually in reverse. You know, I, I would get so many reps up as a kid. Um, so to answer your question, I'd say reps, you know, and based on the reps and the work I put in, it gave me so much confidence in my shot, you know, where I, I sometimes felt like I could shoot my eyes closed, you know, right. like going because you just have it dialed in like that. Mm -hmm. um, now to the point where I was so comfortable in my shot that, and, and relied on it that I wanted to work on other pieces of my game, you know, different forms of, you know, driving, different ways around the rim, different mid-range stuff, because I'd be shooting when I was younger, three after three after three. So it was just so <laughs> easy and comfortable for me. So yeah. that's what my comfort zone was. And so I had to kind of reverse it and try to work on other, other ways. So, um, but I definitely say reps, you know, because when you do the work, you get the confidence after it, knowing the work you put in and, and your yeah. muscle memory just is built in. And so I would always be repping it out. Um, you know, I didn't, I grew up in a smaller town, like, you know, so there wasn't always someone to play with or a five on five pickup game. And so um, I'd have to find ways. And so I went outside and I was just shooting, you know, every single night there was a, a light outside on the road where I put my hoop. And so, I had to think of Kurt, my mommy coming for 1030 or something because the neighbors had to go to sleep. And so up until 1030, I was out there shooting every night. And that was kind of my routine. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. I did. So knowing you for as long as I have, like you've always been a positive, super positive individual. I've literally never seen you mad. It's crazy to me. But <laughs> being at the level that you play at and obviously the talent that you are, how, how is it that you're so able to keep your head on all the time? Like you always on, you know, a cool mentality you always keep your poise in pressure situations and you do a lot for people like I remember like me and you like in Australia like I wasn't getting like the playing time and stuff just playing on the team like you know how it goes with the with the senior men's team and everything and you were just in my ear just like you know what I'm saying take advantage of the opportunities in practice take advantage of the opportunities when you get to play take advantage of everything and you know it's not every day you get to be in Australia and get to you know you you, you help me like get out that mindset that that selfish mentality so I think that um it, it says a lot to your character. I just want to know how you're able to consistently be that way, like in any situation, like whether you're playing or not, you're always being a positive leader and always seems like you're never getting pressured in situations that are crazy situations. I remember us being in, in Brazil or other situations like that. And it's just like the, the, the environment is so intense, but you're still keeping your poise. I didn't know that that's what it looks like from the outside, that I always look calm because sometimes on the inside, I'm not always. Um, you know, I think I think it's one of those things I, I really don't think about too much. Um, you know, I just try to be who I am, be true to myself at the end of the day. Um, but if I were to think about how it came about like that, I guess it's, again, just kind of my upbringing when I was young, you know, that my roots, um, you know, care about other people um, at the end of the day, you know, we're all human. We're all going through things. And so, um, you know, care for the next person beside you just as much as yourself. And 
Mm-hmm. Uh, treat others the way you want to be treated. You know, simple principles that you're always taught growing up. Um, but then even to this day, you know, I, it's one of those things I, I really, you know, enjoy doing is um, developing myself, you know, not just with, like we talked about earlier, basketball, dribbling and, and shooting and this kind of stuff. It's, it's how can I make myself better as a person, a father, a husband, all that kind of stuff every single day. Cause um, at the end of the day, we step on the court as humans, you know? So the more secure and the more stable and the more confident and more happy you are as a human, I feel like that translates onto the court as well. And then you take it off the court and it translates to your life. And so everything that I try to do now, even more than ever, you know, when I was a kid, that stuff was kind of important, I guess, when I was in college, kind of important, but now, and more than ever, being a father, husband, friend, um, son, everything, it's, it's super important to me. And so I've felt that development in my life and, and every single day waking up um, and having a goal to try and better myself. And, and the ways that I've been doing that is trying to meditate, trying to reflect, trying to uh, find purpose, um, whether that's with some sort of religion or faith or anything, just continuing to learn and everything every single day. Um, and I feel like that kind of stuff helps just calm everything in your mind down and, and bring you to, to peace and set you in the right direction um, with everything. So I, I know that's a lot, but uh, it's something that I'm really passionate about these days, you know, yeah. is, is really bettering myself aside from basketball. Because like we said, basketball gets you till here, but what's going to get me till here is those other things, you know, and, and these things are lifelong. And so it's something I'm, I'm really striving for and working every single day. Okay, awesome. You mentioned that you were married. Congratulations on that. And then you also Thank mentioned you. that you're a father. I know you just had like a beautiful daughter. Um, we were in Australia, I think, during the time of your wife's pregnancy, and it was like her third trimester. So you were kind of yeah. like, dang, I might miss the <laughs> I might miss the birth of my child, but luckily, yeah. luckily you did it. How is it balancing, especially for you know, a lot of guys our age are, you know, you know, they're fathers now and they have families. You know, I spoke to Tyler Ennis about this as well. But how is it balancing being a basketball player and then also being a husband and a father? Yeah, no, that's a good question. It's something that I'm still working on right now because I'm a, a new father, you know, so I'm really trying to, to develop that. But um, like I said, it puts perspective in your mind, you know, when once you see your, the birth of your first child and you see, you know, how much um, – that that one thing can mean to you you know it's more important than anything else and you have a responsibility now to to support that baby and support your family and um you know just raise that baby so um the balance for me is just again like i said getting better every single day um i go to work with that in mind you know every single day i go to on the basketball court i enjoy it good day bad day on the court life goes on, you step yeah. back and, and you, you get home and now you're changing diapers and feeding the baby and crawling on the floor doing that kind of stuff, you know? And again, it puts in perspective, whether you miss 10 shots or you make 10 shots, it's like, you're going home to do the same thing no matter what. And that baby yeah. really doesn't care. You yeah. know, that baby doesn't care if you made 10 or missed 10. And so yeah. um, the balance is actually a little bit easier than, than I thought. My wife's been incredible. She's mm-hmm. She's killing it as a mother. Um, makes it really easy on me for sleep and that kind of stuff because that can get tricky, of course. But um, she's dominating as a mother, and I'm really impressed, and it's made it really easy on me. So I'm enjoying it so far. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Congratulations again. Uh, so you've been playing overseas pretty much since you, you know, um, left uh, Gazanga. What are some of the, you know, the pros and the cons of playing overseas? I know like a lot of guys have, I have my, my you know, my own stories as well, but it, it's the beauty of the grind. Like it's just the beauty of the struggle and you make the most of it. Everywhere you go, you get to travel the world. Um, you get to see some amazing people and play some amazing basketball in countries that you never, you know, even knew existed. So <laughs> the fact that you're able to play overseas um, for such a long time and continue to, you know, reach the amount of success that you have, what is some of the advice you get to people who are also going overseas to play basketball? Yeah, so you played in you played in Poland and Japan. I played in Poland. That's it. I was getting ready to go to France this year, but I got hurt. So we'll see what happens next year. Yeah, yeah. So overseas is it's it's really interesting. It's amazing and it can be a grind, like you said, yeah. at the same time. Um and it sounds bad when I put this up, but there's no perfect situation, you know. So either the basketball is a little off, the city's a little off, the weather's a little like there's always yeah. something, you know, and so there's not going to be a perfect situation. So I think, 
I think the growth you can make over here is incredible. The struggle is there for yeah. sure. And there's tough times. The time difference is tough. You know, you don't get to talk to family that much. The distance, you don't get to see many people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're in countries in like the city in the middle of nowhere, like you said, <laughs> you know? And so yeah. it's really a grind. But then with that being said, there's not all negatives. The positives also, the competition out here is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, the fans are unbelievable and the, the passion they have for basketball is amazing. So you really do grow as a person and a, and a player, um, you know, a lot because of the, the stuff you go through in the competition at the level. And so uh, the cool part about overseas too, is there's always ways to move up, you know, whether in a small town or a smaller club, um, you do well and you keep moving up and you keep on, um, you know, furthering your career, uh, making more money, making, living in a better city, whatever it is. And so, um, there's so much opportunity. And I think for guys growing up, it's an unbelievable goal to have in mind because you can really make a living and support your family while playing the game that you love to play. Um, doesn't get much better than that at the end of the day. And there's guys, there's guys over here that have played for two years and there's guys that have played for close to 20. Like yeah. there are guys over here that are just really grinding it out. So um, I think it's incredible for people to, to experience it. It's hard to explain to people back home that haven't actually been over here because it is like a world of its own. You know, people back home don't always even know it exists, <laughs> the basketball league in Europe. And they sometimes think that it's all in one, you know, there's like hundreds of leagues and they all think like Europe is just like one. Yeah, big one league. League, yeah. Um, so it's complicated, but no, it's, it's incredible. And I've uh, really enjoyed it. This is my sixth season. And wow. so hopefully, hopefully some more after this. We'll yeah. see. I know there'll be more. Uh, me, you know, playing for the junior, the cadet team and junior men's team, then finally the senior men's national team. I know what it means to me to put on the Canadian jersey. Um, you know, it, it has so much pride with it because I'm just so patriotic about just being from this country and what the country has done for my family, just coming from Jamaica. And as someone who's like one of our captains and our leaders of Team Canada, what does it mean for you every time you're able to compete for for our country? Yeah, you know, I. As a kid, I was growing up, I, I didn't really, I enjoyed playing for my country and it was our country, but I didn't really realize the significance mm-hmm. always until now when I'm older and I really look back and I, I love playing anytime I can for Team Canada. Um, like you said, because Canada raised us, they supported our family. We, they gave us the opportunities and everything that we have. So to be able to wear Canada on your chest is an unbelievable honor you know, because of everything that we've grown up and been through. When I was younger, it was like, oh, I'm one of the top 10 to 15 players in the country. Like, you know, yeah. that's all you really think about. Um, but now when you look back, there's so much more than just that, you know, and being able to, to represent your country and, and your family members and everything that you've, you've gone through growing up. And so like my, my family's from Holland and Slovenia. And so they came into Canada and were, were accepted, you know, and we had unbelievable upbringing and opportunities and stuff and so um now being older we think of that stuff and it's amazing and and on top of that stuff too we get to travel the world we went to australia we went to we've been to where australia argentina germany we've been to so many countries a lot of italy we've been to a lot of countries together and get to explore the world and and really it it broadens your perspective like crazy and so Mm -hmm. uh, i love playing for the national team any chance i get would love to make an Olympics. Um, obviously, there's so many complications with that right now, but that would be unbelievable to, to have that experience and represent Canada on the world stage. Um, and yeah, so it's it's always an honor. I've, I've always enjoyed it. That transitions to my next question. So you talked about wanting to make the Olympics. When it's all said and done and you're retired, what do you want to accomplish as a basketball player in your career? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think for myself, I have a lot of goals that – for the most part, I, I keep to myself, you know, that, that I want to accomplish individually. Um, I want to, I want to win a lot of championships wherever I am. I want to try and win championships. I think um, when you're winning, it just, it, it signifies that you're doing things the right way. Yeah. You know, whether your role is having two, five points a game, or 20 points a game, if you're winning, you're doing your thing. And I think um, as a competitor, you just always want to win. And so mm-hmm. want to win some championships. Um, and have that, of course, to finish off. And then the main thing, and this is hard to kind of quantify, but I just want to be the best player I can be. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, if, if I can retire and say, like, you know, I squeezed every last drop I could out of myself to be mm-hmm. the best player I could be, then 
and, and be, you know, super happy post basketball career. Um, yeah. And it's hard because how do you really measure that? But yeah. I think for me, that's, that's what I try to focus on every single day is how can I be the best basketball player I can be? Aside from obviously the team accolades, individual accolades, that kind of stuff, that's, that's a bonus on top of it. But that's, that's what motivates me every single day I wake up. Wow, that's awesome. All right, so that's it. We're going to play put on notice. I'm going to put 24 seconds on the shot clock. Uh, can we rapid fire? Okay. All right, so. Rapid fire, okay. <laughs> All right, you ready? Great, let's do it. Okay. Jeans or sweats? Sweats. <laughs> Movies or TV shows? Movies. iPhones or Samsungs? iPhones. Oh, wow. Books or video games? Books. <laughs> MJ or LeBron? MJ. Ooh, salmon or chicken? <laughs> what was that? Salmon or chicken? Uh, chicken. IG or Twitter? IG. And Lil Wayne or Drake? Drake. Ooh. <laughs> That's tough. That's good. Nice. Good 24 seconds. Man, I thought she was gonna go a little Wayne because I remember I remember that the Carter three. Always, you know, always when I was younger. Oh, always you know when I was younger. I know that's why I had to think about it. I was like old Kev would have said little Wayne, but exactly. I think now I listen to Drake old all the Kev time. Loves for little Wayne. That's <laughs> but uh um, you know, I appreciate you being on my show, man. Kevin Pango is someone that you know I consider a big brother. Um, someone that, you know, like I said, I look up to draw a lot of inspiration from and I've known him for a very long time and he's helped me off and on the court tremendously with my habits. And um, I appreciate the friendship that we have and I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks, Great Eight. Love you, little bro. This is fun. <laughs>